Eli, Eli, lema sebachai. Those are the words Jesus said according to the Gospel of Matthew. Eli, Eli, lema sebachai. They mean, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's a cry of complete and utter desperation as Jesus hangs on the cross, bruised, beaten, whipped, taunted, jeered, and humiliated. He had been hung on that cross in the morning following a trial by Pilate, in which Pilate could find no fault. But Pilate heeded the demands of the people to have Jesus, King of the Jews, crucified. Now, Jesus had foretold his betrayal and death for several weeks, at first in broad terms, but in the days leading up to his death, very clearly. It's clear beyond a doubt that Jesus was indeed in control of these circumstances. As he prayed to God the Father in the hours before his betrayal, the Gospel of Matthew records Jesus telling the Father, Not what I want, but what you want. Let your will be done. Indeed, Jesus knew what was coming, and yet he went voluntarily. God's will is one of grace. God's will is one of reunification with creation. Perhaps this is why Jesus barely said a word at his trial. Pilate practically begged him to say something, to give him a reason for what was going on, give him a reason to announce his pardon. Yet for the most part, Jesus remained silent when asked question after question. God had a mission, a mission through Jesus. Since the days of Adam and Eve, sin had entered into the world. And sin has such a grasp on the hearts of humanity, it's said that we are slaves to it. We are slaves to it. Sin takes the form, takes many forms. It looks like greed, ambition, jealousy, anger, hate, violence, theft. But what is central to sin is that it's the person's human motivation that drives it. Self-interest. Not the common interest, not God's interest, but selfishness and self-interest. When we fail to account for the general welfare and are accountable before the Lord, we easily fall trapped to sin. And as we see in Genesis chapter 2, the wage of sin is death. Since the days of Adam and Eve, humankind has been plagued with death, separated from God's perfection, unable to to be in the presence of God for eternity. And as we see throughout the Old Testament, we see the toll that sin takes on individuals and even on entire communities. We see how it corrupts, how it warps minds, how it destroys. But there's no greater punishment for sin than death and all that death entails. So it's our understanding that the wage of sin is death. Sin had a grasp on humanity, and it was not willing to let go. Humanity was simply unable to earn righteousness. Humanity could not. Humanity would not sufficiently live up to the commands of God to reconcile that relationship. We could not live in holy union with God for eternity. Indeed, only a perfect person would be able to pay that price. Only a perfect person could pay that price. No mere human could do that. Here's the important part about all this. Jesus, the incarnate God himself, willingly paid that price. Not for one, but for all. Jesus foretold these events so as to make it clear. He was indeed the Lamb of God. The Lamb for all. The perfect Lamb. The one and only flawless person free of the sin of humanity who willingly, willingly laid down his life for us to pay that debt. So when we hear Jesus say those words, Eli, Eli, lema sebachani, there can be no doubt Jesus took on, willingly and intentionally took on the sin of all humanity and took it with him to the cross. Jesus as Lamb of God atoned for the sins of all humanity. 
But the greatest part of all this is that the cross, that horrible death of the cross, the most despicable death imaginable, the most painful, the most horrific, the most humiliating death possible, the cross which was reserved just for the select few, seems so vile that not even a Roman citizen could be sentenced to that cross. That cross is a cross of grace. <clears throat> and it's a symbol that we recognize as a cross of love today. To tell us that. That was the last word of Jesus according to the Gospel of John. To tell us that. It means it is finished. What's finished? The work of Jesus as the Lamb of God. Romans 5 says, therefore. You know it's important when it says therefore. Therefore. Just as sin came into the world through one man. And death came through sin. And so death spread to all because all have sinned. Sin was indeed in the world before the law, but sin is not reckoned where there is no law. Yet death exercised dominion from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sins were not like the transgressions of Adam, who was a type of the one to come. Therefore, again, you know it's important. Therefore, just as one man's trespass led to the condemnation for all, so one man's act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all. For just as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. But law came in, and with the result that the trespass multiplied, but where sin increased, grace abounds all the more. So that just as sin exercised dominion in death, so grace might exercise dominion through justification, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. <coughs> Friends, this is the gospel. This is the good news. This is the message of Christ. This is why we celebrate Easter. Through the action of Christ, through the grace of God, all can be made righteous. All can reclaim that relationship with the Lord. All can be justified through the faith in Christ. All can receive grace. As it is written, where sin increased, grace abounds all the more. But friends, here tonight, we are not yet at Easter. Tonight we have a duty, a call, a responsibility to remember that great sacrifice of Jesus not only that it happened, but why it happened. We need to recognize that Easter makes no sense without the crucifixion. In order to praise God on Easter, we have to stop. We have to praise God on Good Friday to remember what happened on that day. The purpose of Good Friday, as I understand it, is to take a time out, to pause, and to recognize our need for grace. Grace is freely given. It's given and received through faith alone. But we need this grace. Need. Not only do we need to receive this grace, but we need to give this grace. We need to stop right now. We need to pause and take an account of ourselves. Jesus died on that cross for the sins of the world. The world, the past, the present, and the future. Jesus died on that cross for the sins of the Jews. Jesus died on that cross for the sins of the Gentiles. Jesus died on that cross that anybody who chose to believe in him might receive imputed grace. Imputed grace, that's the word Wesley used. It means you don't earn it, it's just given to you. Jesus has paid the price for you. And because he's paid that price for you, you receive this grace, you receive Jesus' perfection. It wipes clean your account, and you are set free from the wage of sin. Friends, we pause tonight to recognize that this death, this horrible, horrible death that Jesus suffered, is the death that we deserve. I thank God that the God I know, through the history of the Bible, through the history of the world, and through Jesus Christ, I thank God that this God, my God, is the God of grace. It's appropriate tonight 
when we remember all this, to be filled with pain. It's appropriate to feel anguish and sorrow and even to be morose. It's our sin Jesus took with him to that cross. It's your sin, it's my sin, it's all of our sin. This is why Jesus had to die. The wage of sin is death, and the death our sin deserves took place with Jesus. And lastly, as much as this is caused to be downtrodden and depressed, this is also a time for calmness, for hope. But most importantly, it's a time for love. Only when we remember, when we remember our own nature, our broken, sinful nature, and what our rightful place should be, only when we recognize the truly disgusting nature of the cross, only when we recognize all of that can we begin just begin to see the unimaginable love of God. Jesus went willingly to the cross. Jesus was the Lamb of God. This is God's plan. This is God's will. Jesus, the incarnate God Himself, the creator of the cosmos, according to John chapter 1, paid the wage for our sin once for the many. This God, the Almighty, the all-powerful, the all-knowing God, loves you so much that this God took on human form, allowed Himself to be murdered so that we wouldn't have to be. This act is an unspeakable act of love. It's unfathomable. How can such a God that created the cosmos, the expanses, all that there is, and who sustains us daily, who gives us our breath, who by His breath breathes into being, how is it that this God would pay this price for us? I don't understand it. It's beyond my comprehension. But this love is unlike any I have ever seen. My last thought. Yesterday, Kelly preached a sermon in which Jesus gave us one final new commandment at the Last Supper. He told his disciples, Love one another, just as I have loved you. You also should love one another. The prophet Isaiah foretold a time after the coming of the Lord in which the wolf shall live with the lamb and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, the calf and the lion and the fat one together, and the little child shall lead them, the cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox, the nursing child shall play over the hole of the ass, and the weaned child shall put his hand in the adder's den. They will not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord, as the waters covers the sea. Friends, when this happens, we can all say to Telestai. To Telestai indeed. It is finished. When we stop on Good Friday to think about what happened, when we pause tonight to recognize how great this love is, how unimaginable this love is that God has for us, and that God calls us to love one another and all of creation the same way that God loves us, the same self-sacrificial way. Think about the peace that this would usher in. When I started tonight, I talked about the root of sin, and I said, sin takes many forms. Greed, ambition, jealousy, anger, hate, violence, theft. But what is central to sin is that it is the human's personal motivation that drives it. Self-interest, not common interest, not God's interest, but selfishness. When we fail to account for the general welfare or our accountability before the Lord, we easily fall trapped by sin. That's what I said. But tonight we pause to recognize not only the cost of this sin, Sin leads to death, it leads to the separation from the wholeness of God, and it leads to separation even from each other. But this cost, this death, has already been paid. 
This debt was paid by our God who loves us so much to undergo the worst of the worst suffering ever imagined. The God who humbled himself by taking on human form endured human life only to give it up as an atonement on our behalf. How great a love this must be. I don't even have words for this love. It's indescribable. This love will truly transform the world. Just imagine it. This is how we are called to love one another. If we do this, the vision of Isaiah would be reality. When that happens, we can then, we can then join Jesus in his words, and we too can say to tell us that. To tell us die indeed, it is finished. This is what Good Friday means to me. Amen.